Hey everyone, and welcome to Prime Comments Episode 2. And we're just going to get right into your comments this week on the 10. Yes, 10 videos released over the past week. Because uh, I have a lot to say, and you had, had some interesting responses. So first, for our 30th episode of the Nintendo Prime Podcast, which, by the way, is we don't have a new episode coming this next week. Again, if you want this podcast to become weekly, go support us over on patreon.com slash Nintendo Prime. I think we're up to $31 right now. If we ever hit that $100 goal, it will become weekly. And for $5, you gain early access to the podcast. And for $20, you can actually be a guest on one podcast episode per month. But enough about that. Let's get into your comments on podcast episode 30. This comment comes from Joshua Jones. He says that I feel like the Switch is the true successor to the Game Boy slash Game Boy Advance era, bringing back games for the gamers and not my aunt and uncle. I haven't owned a system since the SNES other than portables, and the Switch has brought me and my group of friends back. We had given up on Nintendo being a home for gamers a long time ago. But now I have completely changed my tune. My question is, do you feel the reason Nintendo is having success with the Switch is because of the influx of Nintendo fans of yesteryear, like my friends and myself? I'd like to know your views. Uh, yes and no. I think that the Switch has definitely hit a chord with old school fans of Nintendo, uh, especially if you were an old school fan of handheld Nintendo. And I think that's because... When we were growing up as kids, and if you grew up during the Game Boy and Game Boy Advance era, I, I don't think that the Game Boy and Game Boy Advance era really appealed to adults either. Uh, it appealed to children. And as you grew up with the DS and 3DS era, again, those systems appear, you know, appealed to children. Now, that doesn't mean there weren't adults playing it. I saw plenty of adults in colleges and stuff playing 3DS and DS. But the, the gist of it is that you would kind of grow out of being a handheld gamer. And I think that happened to a lot of people over the years where you grew up with a certain generation of handhelds and then you wouldn't play things as you grew up. You would move on to home consoles or PCs or you'd stop gaming altogether. And personally, uh, while I have owned every single Nintendo handheld, it's true that I have actually handheld gamed less and less over the years as I've grown up. The Game Boy and Game Boy Advance, I obviously gamed with a ton. Uh, the DS, I gamed with a lot at the beginning, and then by the middle of its lifespan, I really started cutting back on my handheld gaming. And on the 3DS, I'm just going to be honest, the only reason I even owned the 3DS is because when I worked at Zelda Informer, uh, I wanted to be able to fairly play and review Zelda games, and you'd Ocarina of Time 3D and the Majora's Mask 3D and Link Between Worlds. Uh, all coming to the 3DS, and I love Zelda games so much I really wanted to play them, and I really wanted to be able to talk about them uh, from a perspective of experience. Otherwise, without Zelda games on there, I might not have ever owned a 3DS. Uh, that doesn't mean I didn't play other games on the 3DS. Of course I did, but they weren't a reason for me to buy the system, and 3DS still today stands as my least played handheld game I've owned in my entire life. And again, it's not due to the lack of quality of games. It's just I've, I've grown to a point where I expect more out of my games uh, than what the 3DS and what handheld gaming has been able to offer. And that's what's so fantastic about the Switch is that now it doesn't feel like I have to compromise to have a handheld gaming experience. And I think that's what's drawing a lot of those older fans of like the SNES and you know the, the Game Boy Advance and Game Boy era back is that Back then, it didn't feel like you had a compromising gaming experience. Uh, when you played Game Boy, the compromise was that you weren't playing in color compared to the, the NES. But like gaming and portable gaming, it was such a new feel back then that uh, that was acceptable. When the Game Boy Advance came out, it felt like a portable Super Nintendo, even if it didn't have all of the same games. Uh, a DS, in a way, almost felt like a portable Nintendo 64. And that was all fine and dandy. But for the most part, uh, like the 3DS itself, what is that a portable version of again? It, the handheld's always kind of existed as creating a portable version of the hand of the console side, and that hasn't really happened in a long time, at least in my mind. Uh, at least happened successfully. So I look at the Switch as finally we have an uncompromised portable gaming solution that can give me high quality games like Breath of the Wild and Super Mario Odyssey and Splatoon 2, plus some of the smaller indie games like Overcooked. So I am very, very happy. I think some of the other success of the Switch is it's just an appealing 
thing on its own. Handheld gaming isn't dead, at least not in Japan. It's huge in Japan. Uh, but elsewhere in the world, I think handheld gaming is almost in a resurgence as people are playing games on their phones and they're quickly becoming bored with some of those games and looking for more in-depth experiences. And that doesn't mean there aren't in-depth experiences on a phone. Of course there are. But there's such a mountain of, of you know, not in-depth games on the phone that it's sometimes hard to find them. And it's a lot easier to find a home on Switch for games like NBA 2K or Zelda or Splatoon 2 or Skyrim. Uh, and that doesn't mean that traditional home consoles are out of the way either. Obviously, the PlayStation 4 is doing fantastic. The Xbox One, you know, has done something like N64 numbers, which are pretty good. Uh, there's still a, a place for traditional under-TV home consoles, but I think Nintendo recognizes that things are moving in the direction of tablets. Uh, things are moving in the direction of multi multi-use items. And I feel like the Switch's appeal here is that you have a handheld, you have a home console, and it's in a portable form that's convenient and offers multiple different types of control options for any of the kind of games people want to make. If they want to make motion games, if they want to make quick, uh, take each Joy-Con off and have local two-player games, uh, they've made it very convenient to game in several different ways with the Switch, which I think is really its true, uh, its true selling point and maybe even its true innovation uh, is not that anything that the Switch is doing is the first thing, the, the first time it's ever existed, but it's the first time it's ever exi existed in this complete of a package uh, where it does all these multi-purpose things, mostly thanks to the Joy-Cons, uh, at the same time. So I think that there's just this appeal factor out there of home console gaming on the go. It's a dream people have had. The Vita tried to fulfill it, but it, it felt held back. And the Switch doesn't feel like it's held back. Even though it's not as powerful as contemporary home console boxes, uh, people are okay with that. They, they seem to be okay with that anyways. Now Nintendo just needs to catch up with some of the multi-purpose functionality of a tablet, you know, a web browser, Netflix, all that kind of stuff. That doesn't mean it needs an app store, but it, it just needs to have the, the bare-bones basic functionality of a tablet. And I think they'll get there. I mean, come on, they had Netflix and a web browser on the 3DS. It's going to be on the Switch eventually. But thank you. Thanks for your comment. I hope that answers your question. Uh, next up, we have the ARMS Data Mining unveils nine possible new fighters. And it turns out some of these might have been repeated of old fighters, and there could be old data that's gone. So maybe it's only five. Either way, there was some data mining that unveiled some potential new fighters. And Coma commented that, I can't believe people think a game that sold 1.2 million copies is dying. Even if half the original player base left, it would still have a very healthy amount of players. And this is in reference to uh, a lot of people saying that it's dead on arrival or it's dead, you know, we're a month out from ARMS releasing and now it's dead. That's clearly not the case. Uh, at least when I see ARMS being played, there's no wait time to get matches going. There, uh, there's no player count to know how many people are actively playing it. But that 1.2 million figure, that was just from launch. So by now, it could be up to 1.7, maybe it's 2 million worldwide. We don't know. But it was reviewed very, very well by multiple outlets, and the players seem to really be enjoying it. And while Splatoon 2 probably put a little damper on the player base for a little while, it's going to bounce back. You know, as, as Splatoon 2 starts getting older and people don't feel like they need to play it to get their multiplayer fix every single day, and they start wanting some more variety, and they go back to ARMS, and they start playing ARMS, Splatoon, Smash, Mario Kart. I know Smash isn't out yet, but uh, you kind of get my point that people like variety, uh, some people don't. Some people literally just play one game, and there's probably some people who bought the system for ARMS, and that's all they play is ARMS. It's like there's people who bought it for Zelda, and that's all they play is Zelda, and none of these other games matter. And that's fine. Uh, I'll admit, like I originally bought an Xbox One to play Madden, because Madden's not available on PC. If Madden was available on PC, I would have never bought an Xbox. Uh, and the reason I'm looking at Xbox One X is because, hey, Madden in 4K, that, that's kind of enticing to me. But uh, again, I don't think this year's Madden fully supports true 4K. Uh, I think it's just going to let the Xbox One X upscale it. So, But still, uh, yeah, I, I don't think ARMS is dying. Uh, I, I feel like we're just getting to the, the maturation stage of ARMS where you got over the initial hype wave, now we get to see what kind of legs it has. And I'm very interested to see the sales update on ARMS for uh, the July MPD? Or is it, I'm sorry, the, the August MPD when that comes out. Uh, September MPD, etc. We need to see how it's doing in North America, and then obviously keep track of those sales in Japan. It's still selling decently well in Japan, not nearly as well as you know Mario Kart, you know Splatoon and Zelda, but I don't think in Japan they ever expected those kind of numbers. So they're doing well, and hey, it's almost outsold Street Fighter Five on the PlayStation Four and PC. So 
it's doing something right. That's for sure. So yeah, definitely not dying. Uh, later in the week, I talked about an uh, update that came out for Breath of the Wild. Uh, it was about to come out. Uh, Breath of the Wild update adds Spot Pass like feature to Switch's news channel. And this was update, I believe, 1.3.1. The update is out now. I uh, wasn't very impressed with the first uh, part of it that was released. But uh, this comment comes from GJK-2015. He said, why can't Nintendo Switch system give software update information details under software information like the PlayStation 4 when you press the plus button so I know what's updated instead of going on the official site all the time for the information. I think you make a really good point. I always felt weird with Nintendo products, and I'm sure this has happened with other products, but I'm talking specifically about Nintendo, where update information for games isn't really included in the the system itself. You go to update a game, it says, oh, an update's available for the game, but it doesn't tell you what it's fixing. It's a, even if it's just a stability update or a performance increasing update, uh, it would be good to just even have that information available. Can you tell me what this patch does? You always seem to have to go online to find the patch notes. Yes, you can find them all through Nintendo's official website, but who's going to go to Nintendo's official website to look up specific game updates? It can be very tiresome, and Nintendo's website isn't always the snappiest or the quickest. So chances are you're finding out about these updates through people like me on YouTube or through Nintendo Everything in my Nintendo and finding out all these patch notes, and that's fine. Obviously, it's good for me. It's good that you need to come to me for these patch notes, but it's bad for the consumer. Uh, consumers should be able to get these patch notes locally on their system uh, before the patch comes out. In fact, there should be, hey, a patch update's coming this week for this game, and here's the notes for it. Or even when the patch releases, here's the notes for the patch, and you can see these before you install it. As, I, as you mentioned, PlayStation allows you to do it. Nintendo's behind the ball on it. Uh, people generally don't make as big a deal about it because a lot of us just update like our phone apps and everything else without even looking at what those updates do, even though our phones do let us know what the updates do. But, uh, well, you know, as much as the developers put in there, you know, obviously they just say, oh, it's a stability update. They're not telling you exactly what they fixed or what they patched. But uh, it is something Nintendo needs to get better at, and I totally agree with you that it is a feature we probably should be more demanding of, and I should probably even talk about more at Nintendo Prime to draw attention to the fact that this isn't happening. So maybe if I do another video someday on a future patch for a game on Switch, uh, I'll make a bigger deal about it, and hopefully someone at Nintendo will notice. I mean, I send some of my videos off to my Nintendo rep, but it doesn't mean that he feels that he shares it with anyone at Nintendo and that they see it and that they care. But the more attention that's brought to it, the higher chance a change is made. I can't imagine it's a tough change for them to include patch notes uh, in the OS. So, uh, The next video from this past week uh, was about Fusion Mode. And specifically, it said Nintendo's clarification of Fusion Mode in Metroid Samus Returns is frustrating. And again, this was me harping on Nintendo for having a harder difficulty mode uh, locked behind Fusion Mode, even though there is a hard mode unlocked in the game itself. Uh, fusion mode is harder than that hard mode. So it's like standard mode, medium mode, and hard mode to me. Uh, they can call it fusion mode or whatever, but anyways. Uh, Avoid T Meadow had this to say. Difficulty settings are a staple feature of game design, comparable to being able to save your game without using a password or having multiple save files. These sorts of things should be included as part of the base experience of a video game. Nintendo was trying to be sneaky about it by calling the highest difficulty setting Fusion Mode. But for me, there's a big difference between a difficulty setting and a more difficult game mode. A difficulty setting is a traditional part of games and doesn't require a huge investment to develop. Increase the damage that mistakes, uh, play test a few times to make sure the balance isn't destroyed, done. A more difficult game mode is something else entirely. A more difficult game mode is something much more involved that changes the core experience of the game on a fundamental level. It would be something like increasing the damage Samus takes, changing the attack patterns of enemies to make them more dangerous, making health pickups and energy tanks more scarce, and adding an additional phase to boss fights to make them enrage at certain health percentage. All of those things together would be a reasonable amount of time and energy to develop and properly playtest. I would say it's fair to make the argument that you should have to pay for that level of content, but it would certainly need to be DLC, and I feel like it wouldn't be fair to ask more than maybe $5. This, however, is not the situation at all. 
At least as far as we've seen, fusion mode isn't a game mode. It's the highest difficulty setting with some cosmetic flair. It shouldn't considered it shouldn't be considered an acceptable business practice to lock this sort of core feature behind a paywall tied to a physical product. If you could unlock the highest difficulty setting of fusion mode by simply beating the game, I think that would be acceptable. It would allow the amiibo to have some nice functionality if it allowed you to unlock it right at the start of the game, and it wouldn't negatively affect those of us who can't or won't purchase the figurines. Hopefully Nintendo will make some changes. Now, on the base premise of Nintendo needs to not have this content locked behind an amiibo, I agree. But I also disagree with some of your statements about uh, having a new mode in the game that makes more difficult AI and cuts back on the amount of items you get uh, and all this other stuff that you say takes more time to play test. I agree it takes more time to play test, but... Games have had this forever. Like Difficulty settings in video games are not just about taking more damage, right? There are some games that are like that. Uh, Zelda is almost infamous for the fact that their hard modes or their hero modes in the past have just been double damage and no recovery hearts. Uh, and that's fine. That's a challenge in that of itself, but that, to me, isn't a difficulty mode. Uh, most games, especially if you play games on PC and you've been doing it for decades, uh, their difficulty settings do more than just make you take more damage. Uh, they do take away specific items in the game. They do add more enemies to the game. They make those enemies AI smarter. Fighting an enemy on easy mode is significantly different than fighting an enemy on the hardest difficulty in the game. And that's always been the case for difficulty settings. So a lot of these things you say are already included in traditional difficulty settings in many games across multiple genres and have been that way for decades. That's why I have a problem with Nintendo even charging $5 for it or locking it behind, you know, charging $5 for it or you buy an Amiibo and get access to it because that's that's really piecemealing the game. And I am against piecemealing. And the thing is, you know, when you say $5, it takes longer to play test. This, this mode, even if it did all of this, it did all the things you say are worth the money, it's available day one. So they're piecemealing the game day one. We're not talking about a future update. Like, I can, I can understand this argument for Breath of the Wild a little bit because Master Mode wasn't complete when the game launched. That's, I mean, I still find issue with it. I, feel, I still feel it should have been a free update to the game. And I still think they could have charged $20 for the story DLC and it probably would have sold the exact same amount of copies that it has so far. But uh, this is wrong. Day one DLC that is piecemealing content from the game behind a paywall is wrong, no matter if it's a digital paywall or an amiibo. Nintendo just makes it even worse because it's just amiibo. Uh, there is no other way to get this content. The Amiibo is sold out. I do not have a pre-order. I go day one and cannot find the Amiibo in the store, and I buy Metroid Samus Returns. I cannot play the hardest difficulty that exists in the game, uh, maybe ever, because I might never be able to get my hands on that Metroid Amiibo. So it's, it's extremely disappointing, and Nintendo's approach to it is even worse than a lot of other companies who will let you pr make a digital purchase of it. Uh, now... Again, I still think it's wrong. I don't think day one content uh, that is this significant should ever be locked behind a paywall at all. There should never be a paywall for this kind of thing. And that's where I have an issue is this stuff's ready now. It, the, the, they're not developing it after the game came out. So, uh, yeah, this is pretty standard. All the things you bring up for difficulty settings and, and what's worth money to you is actually standard. That's what happens in most difficulty settings. Uh, we just have to get outside that Nintendo ecosystem, and you'll see a lot of games already doing this uh, for free. No, no DLC update required to get it. Uh, so, yeah, it is a little ridiculous. Um, yeah, that's all I have to say on that. On the next video, I will dealt with the Nintendo World Championships returning and me announcing that I'm going to be competing in them on September 3rd. Uh, Trevor Grover had this to say about it. Uh, why would they choose Mario Kart 7? That's an odd choice. I can tell you exactly why they chose Mario Kart 7. Not everyone owns a Switch, so it's unfair to run a Nintendo World Championships and have the qualifier be a Switch game because you're not going to be, not everyone's going to have a chance to play Mario Kart 8 Deluxe in practice, right? They, they're trying to get the best in a time trial, which means people are going to need to practice. I haven't even started practicing yet, but people need to practice, and not everyone can get a Nintendo Switch. And you might say, well, Mario Kart 8, they could practice on, you know, even if they did a deluxe version for Switch, they could practice on Mario Kart 8, right? 
Well, the problem with Mario Kart 8 on the Wii U is that Wii U has been discontinued as of last year, so you can't even buy a Wii U. Uh, so Nintendo's in a sticky situation where the original console that it released on is no longer available to purchase, and the current console that's out there is very hard to get your hands on right now. But what isn't hard to get your hands on is a 3DS in Mario Kart 7. So if someone bought a 3DS and Mario Kart 7 specifically to practice for this, or they already own a 3DS, basically there's more 3DSs out there, it's easier to get your hands on, and it's not hard to get a ha your hands on Mario Kart 7. So it makes a lot of sense for them to use Mario Kart 7 instead of Mario Kart 8 or Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, just because there's a higher chance that more people can play that game and prepare for it than Mario Kart 8 Deluxe and Mario Kart 8. Uh, moving on. Uh, uh, the next video that I created this past week said Nintendo continues to top the charts in Japan. In Japan. I mentioned how they sold like 61,000 units of the Switch this past week, uh, and they had huge lines for the Nintendo Switch lottery. And uh, Elder Paladin 98 had this to say, Japan sales are pointless as it will only benefit the Japanese. I want it to sell in the U.S. And to that I say, it is selling in the U.S. We just only get sales updates in the U.S. like every six weeks or every four weeks or whatever the case may be uh, because we don't get sales numbers until the MPD comes out and the MPD only comes out once per month and it's for statements of the prior month and it does not include digital sales unless the company has provided the digital sales to the MPD group and Nintendo traditionally does not provide uh, those sales to the MPD group. Sometimes they'll release a press release along with the release of the MPD, uh, which will include an update to their sales. Uh, and sometimes when they even do this, uh, you'll get a, an update for their sales worldwide on their website in Japan. But usually those updates come quarterly rather than monthly. But it's still, that's why you don't hear about those sales. But the fact that it's continued to be sold out and still hard to get lets you know the sales in the U.S. are doing just fine. I mean... It sold, you know, it's probably well over 200,000 units every single month that it's been out. So I'm, I'm not worried about the Switch sales in the U.S. And I wouldn't call the sales in Japan pointless. Uh, Nintendo is, we have to remember, while most of us that watch this channel are not in Japan and we live in the U.S. or the U.K. or Australia or, you know, an English, a primarily English-speaking place, uh, Nintendo is a Japanese company. So for them, it's very important to do well in that Japanese marketplace. And you got to remember, that's partially probably why they decided to make a hybrid. Because that way they could appeal to home console players in the U.S. and portable gamers in Japan. Uh, it's actually kind of a brilliant idea to try to hit on both demographics. Whether or not they can continue to do it successfully after 2017, we don't know. But this year, things are looking good worldwide, not just in Japan. Moving on. Uh... I started a new series this past week called Prime Family, and the first video was called Prime Family, Introducing a Six-Year-Old to Nintendo Games, and that video uh, was just an introduction to the series. Uh, I had my daughter on, and this upcoming week, she's going to be playing Splatoon 2 for the first time. Now, she's seen me play it, but she's never played herself, so I'm going to get her set up with her own account on my Switch, and then let her play, uh, play Splatoon 2 for her first time, and see how she does. And have it recorded, with me sitting next to her, trying to help her out, and her seeing the raw, her raw feelings for the game as she's going through it. Her frustrations, her joy, her uh, getting mad and hopefully not throwing my Switch. <laughs> um, all of that's going to be captured on camera uh, and obviously edited and presented to you guys. Uh, so I'm hoping that you guys are looking forward to that. Uh, some people have asked about live streaming it. That's not going to happen. And before I get to this one comment, I just want to say thank you to everyone who had a lot of kind words to say about myself as a father uh, or my daughter. Uh, it's just, it's wonderful. Uh, when you see negative comments all the time, sometimes it's hard to uh, realize that there's a lot of positivity out there as well. And you guys really showed a lot of support for me and my family and this series. I'm glad you enjoy it. I can't wait to get the first real episode of Prime Family out to you guys. Uh, but Luigi had this to say. At the 225 mark, a six-year-old Minecraft fan actually accepted an opinion there. And I responded to this uh, originally by saying it's all about parenting. And what I want to get across here is that all fan bases have a hard time accepting opinions that are contrary to their own. And even this happens within fan bases. You know, I, for the longest time, I held Zelda 2 as the greatest Zelda game of all time until I played Breath of the Wild. And yes, I had played every single Zelda game and beaten every single Zelda game. 
Uh, and I would get a lot of flack for still holding that opinion that Zelda 2 was the best Zelda game. No, it has to be A Link to the Past. It has to be Ocarina of Time or Majora's Mask or Twilight Princess or, heck, they'd even accept Skyward Sword as an acceptable uh, answer or Spirit Tracks or something like that over Zelda 2. And I would get a lot of flack for that. And then there's also times when uh, I'll get flack for saying things like, I'm not that excited for Metroid Samus Returns. And there's people that will... Uh, even, I even noticed it a lot in the comments this week on some of the videos. Yeah, Nintendo's number one. Sony and Microsoft suck. Like, why? Who cares? Um, fanboyism sucks. There's a lot of awesome things going on with Sony and Microsoft. And as a gamer, you really shouldn't just write them off because they're not Nintendo. That, that's really what people do. And so hearing, you know, someone uh, say that, you know, a Minecraft fan actually accepting an opinion here, it's just a fan of gaming accepting an opinion. And, I, and again, I feel like this has to do a lot with how you're raised. I was raised by two wonderful parents who taught me that while you can have an opinion, it's okay for other people to have your opinion. And it's really weird because my dad's extremely political, so if you have any political opinion that's against his, he will vehemently argue against it. And that just seems to be the way politics work. But that's not how it has to work in gaming. I think if you raise your kids the right way, they can learn that it's okay for people to like playing different games that you don't. It's perfectly acceptable. She's okay that I don't like playing Minecraft. It's fine. She could still play Minecraft. I understand it. I've played it. I know how it works. But it's okay that I, you know, that, that she plays it and I don't. That she watches YouTubers uh, that play it and that I don't. It, it's okay for us to have different tastes in life. Just like it's okay if my kids are in the sports or music or band or you know, just really into reading. Whatever, you know, if all three of my kids are, have all these different likes, it's going to be hard for me to manage as a parent because i got to try to be there for all of them in different ways. But... It's okay, and I think like that's an important thing with parenting with games. If you're if you're a, a gaming parent out there or a parent that plays games and is trying to raise their kids up into games, uh, it doesn't matter if they start with Nintendo. It doesn't matter if they start with tablets or phones. Uh, my you know, my daughter didn't start with Nintendo. She her she's actually her first game ever was Angry Birds on my phone back in the day, and she play does play a lot of games on tablets, which is how she actually got introduced to Minecraft was on a tablet. And at her other dad's fault, like I'm her stepdad, so her biological father uh, got her Minecraft on the Xbox. And that's fine. She, she plays Minecraft on Xbox, too, uh, and plays Minecraft on PC at some friends' houses. Like, it's okay. I don't mind. I don't care what platform she plays on. My goal with the Prime Family series is that since we're a Nintendo channel, I'm going to introduce her to Nintendo games. Because she. that's one thing that happens is... She hasn't really been introduced to Nintendo. She knows I play Nintendo. She's seen me play Mario and Mario Kart. She's never played this stuff herself. Um, I mean, she did attempt Mario Kart once and got frustrated, but she hasn't played Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, which is important because it includes an assist mode in there that I think is really going to make her happy, and that's going to be a future uh, episode as well of Prime Families where we, we go through some Mario Kart 8 Deluxe um, and see if she now likes the game when she's got a little help at her age. So, yeah. Uh, again, if you just raise your kids to be more accepting of different tastes of different people, uh, the whole world would be better. You know, we, we should make the new generation of children better, more intelligent, and more accepting than the prior generation. That's what I always say. Anyways, moving on to uh, our, I believe this is our third to last video. Oh, wait, no, we got, oh, there's so many videos. I made a ton of videos this week. Uh, the Joy-Con lawsuit threatens to shut down Nintendo Switch sales entirely. Uh, and again, this is what a lawsuit that is currently by Game Vice uh, against Nintendo with a patent on something that sounds similar to the Joy-Cons and how they connect to the Switch and all that. Uh, and Timothy X had this to say about it. I generally feel sorry for Game Vice. They're going to get their asses curb stomped by Nintendo in court. As if they'll just allow some mediocre company to stop them from selling their first stock maker in years, lol. And I have an interesting response to this because I've read a lot of comments on it. And in hindsight, uh, I didn't clarify why I'm afraid. Nintendo, uh, I'm not, I don't think in the next five years the Switch is being shut down. Nintendo is going to have a full generation with Switch before they need to worry about anything. Because even if they lost the lawsuit, they're going to tie it up with appeals. And how I know this is because they've already done this. Uh, in case you didn't know. Nintendo lost a lawsuit over the 3D screens in their Nintendo 3DS. And if you actually go through the documents on that loss, it's very clear that Nintendo more than likely stole the 3D tech, used it without permission uh, in those screens. And the glasses-free 3D is fantastic or whatever. And they lost. But 
Instead of having to shut down production right away, Nintendo immediately appealed. And that wrapped things up in court for another two years. And then Nintendo eventually did win on appeals, which is why you still see the 3DS sold today with a 3D screen. Now, obviously, if they had lost on the appeal, as of today, they would probably just sell the new 2DS XL. They wouldn't, they wouldn't release any more with 3D screens. And Nintendo would still probably be just fine. But that was like five years after the fact. They finally wrapped up that lawsuit. So... Even if Nintendo lost this lawsuit to Game Vice and even lost on appeal, it would still probably be wrapped up in the courts for three to five years. And by then, we're already looking at what the next generation of Switch is going to be. And by then, Nintendo could have released a new revision on Switch that um, circumvents the entire lawsuit and isn't an issue or would require an extra lawsuit, which would again would wrap things up in there for like a decade. So uh, that's why I have a concern about what... Uh, this this lawsuit does. And we have to remember, Nintendo doesn't always win. Yes, they won the lawsuit over the Wiimote. They lost the lawsuit on the 3D screen and then won it on appeal. And they actually, if you want a lawsuit that they actually lost, lost, they lost the lawsuit on the Wavebird and they lost the uh, lawsuit uh, when they appealed it on the Wavebird. So they completely lost everything with the Wavebird. That's why the Wavebird had such a short-lived life cycle and why Nintendo can't re-release it. They can't remake it. Uh, there's nothing they can do about the Wavebird. In fact, Nintendo even technically lost a lawsuit on the actual GameCube controller, but they won on appeal. So that's why they can make GameCube controllers still today for Smash and everything, because they did eventually appeal and win it. So Nintendo has dealt with these lawsuits, and they do not always come out on top. So while patent trolls are a thing, it's important to remember they're a thing because sometimes it works. Sometimes they just get the payment they want. Sometimes they lose. Sometimes they win. So we just have to keep this in mind that just because we get angry and we think Game Vice is going to get wrecked, we've seen smaller companies than Game Vice win against Nintendo. So we have to remember that when we're talking about this conversation. And that's why I have a concern level about this because and while Nintendo gets sued all the way, it's not always in their favor in the courts. So, and by the way, we can't make any assumptions of uh, what Nintendo knew or didn't know while they were making the Joy-Cons. In fact, I'd argue it's almost better if Nintendo didn't know about this patent when they were making the Joy-Cons because that makes it even less likely that they violated the patent because then they weren't looking at a patent of a device and trying to circumvent it, which some companies do do. Moving on. The next video I did this past week was about a couple days ago, and it was called Ending the Nick Robinson Saga, My Final Word. And I'm not going to say a whole lot on this per se, because I feel like I, I covered everything I needed to in that video. Uh, but OTBWY had this to say, I am still subbed. All I want to say is, please just keep out of the drama news. I like the channel. I don't want it to turn into one of those. I'm here for Nintendo news and discussions. Peace. And just like I kind of said in a comment on the video, I'll kind of repeat now for everyone to hear. Drama is not something I really ever plan to cover. Uh, Nintendo Prime as my primary YouTube channel, at least for now, until I build a big enough audience and can maybe launch secondary channels for other things like maybe Xbox or PlayStation, or uh, I really want to launch a tech, tech enthusiast channel someday. Uh, when I look at all of this stuff, uh, about Nick Robinson and the drama, I look at it as Nintendo Prime is like an outlet for me to release my emotions. And a lot of times, if something comes up that I'm reading about or a video I've watched and I have all these thoughts bubble, bubbling in my head, I literally cannot make a new Nintendo video until I get those thoughts out because it's really hard for me to clear my mind of what I'm thinking about to refocus on something Nintendo. And that's why I covered the Nick Robinson situation in the first place, because I couldn't get it out of my head. I tried to make other Nintendo videos, and all of them were even at a worse quality than you usually see here, if you can believe it or not. So I was not comfortable publishing those videos, and I still haven't. In fact, some of the video files I've completely deleted with no plans to ever bring them back, uh, including when I was actually working on, finally, the second episode <laughs> of uh, Setup Crusade, which some of you guys might not even know what that is at this point. And uh, I actually had to trash that whole video because it was not of a quality level that I was proud of. So I don't plan to cover drama on this channel. Uh, and when I do cover drama, if I ever do cover it, I don't. I consider it less covering drama and more covering things I'm passionate about. And 
on YouTube as a platform, sometimes that'll mean covering things that's happening to other gaming YouTubers. Uh, I'm very happy that Boogie2988 got gastric bypass surgery, and I've been following that religiously, hoping he recovers well, which he seems to be doing pretty decently well with, with minimal concerns, and I'm hoping he meets his weight loss goals with this gastric bypass surgery and has a long, healthy life ahead of him. Uh, and I follow things like what happened with Angry Joe and his channel and the locking of comments because he wants to take a break from the angry reviews for a couple months and uh, all the drama that surrounded that. And I understand why some people don't... There, there's so many YouTubers that talk about this stuff. I can understand why uh, you don't want me to cover this kind of thing. But I always feel like Nintendo Prime is still my channel to do with what I want. And sometimes I need to release my emotions. Now, I didn't need to do it with Angry Joe and Boogie2988 because I felt like Angry Joe and Boogie2988 handled their situations very, very well. Uh, or about as well as they could have handled it, given what was happening at the time. Uh, in fact, yeah, Angry Joe went from having all of his videos, uh, not having comments, uh, because they were getting completely disliked and trashed, uh, to after addressing the issue and talking about it you know, a week later, uh, he brought comments and likes back, and now all his videos are back up to their usual positive comments and, and, and massive like ratio, like to dislike ratio. So uh, he, he it worked. Whether or not you like what he did, it worked. Uh, and obviously with Boogie 2988, you just, I mean, I have nothing but, but love and respect for that man. He has gone through a lot in his life, and he's a, he's kind of an inspiration for me as a YouTuber. Uh, him and, and, you know, the, even people who haven't necessarily been, had as rough of a life, but like Easy Allies is an inspiration for me, kind of funny, all those people. So sometimes I want to talk about them, but it's not going to be a normal thing at the channel. It's going to be a rare time that it comes up. Uh, because, again, I like to focus on Nintendo and things I have to say about Nintendo. So, anyways. Uh, again, it's not going to be a normal part of the channel, but every once in a while I just have to get it off my chest. Uh, and hopefully in the future I have a separate channel for that. Uh, next up. Uh, the next video we did was a study showing that 3D Mario games are helping your short-term memory. And Lenny Wright had this to say, I have a friend that plays shooters almost exclusively with terrible short-term memory. I guess I know why now? Question? Uh, maybe. You don't know for sure if this is why he has a short-term memory issue because the studies are inconclusive. It's only one study. There needs to be multiple of them done. And it's possible he had short-term memory issues before he even played shooter games. So I don't know if sure shooter games are to blame for short-term memory. Uh, just this one study shows that if you learn things in a certain way, if you're, if, if you memorize things in a certain way, that the shooter game can negatively impact him. And I don't know that your friend does memorize things in that way because it only affects a certain type of memory uh, in a certain type of way. So uh, at least according to this one study. So more studies need to be done. Uh, I don't, I don't want to jump to the conclusions of if you play Mario games, you have better memory, and if you play shooter games, you have worse memory, because that's not really what the study was saying. It had to do with gray matter, and you can still have a high amount of gray matter. Uh, <laughs> even if you get a lower amount of gray matter by playing shooter games, it doesn't necessarily mean that you don't still have a high amount of gray matter. There's other things in your life that affect how much gray matter are in your brain. So, yeah, let's not jump to conclusions here that your friend uh, has memory issues because he plays shooter games. That's not what this study actually proved, so... Uh, more research needs to be done, and again, there's more things that impact your memory than video games. So, moving on. Uh, this past week, I released my first in a while of a product review, uh, and it was, is this the ba best battery bank for Nintendo Switch? Where I look at the ra uh, two RAV power banks that were sent to me, and uh, I was pretty impressed with them, even though the claims that were given to me in the email didn't really pan out exactly as I hoped. Um... And Fabio Tremonte, I'm sorry if I butchered that, had this to say. Uh, this is what a review looks like. Effort, expectations, examples, and a very outstanding depth of product usage. Also unbiased, keep it up, dude. And to that I say thank you. Uh, when I'm reviewing something, uh, there's so many people that review products. Sometimes it's hard to stand out. And I know the stand out here is that this is my opinion, right? And that's a standout for anyone is that they're giving their own personal opinion on it. And if you trust that person's opinion, it doesn't matter what 17 other people say. If you trust that one person, great. And my goal here is to make it so people cannot, 
I can trust what I say about a product in a review because because what I say in an opinion piece about say you know Nintendo stock or something or or whether I feel like the Switch should replace the 3DS is different than taking a literal product you know product putting it in a real life situation and examining its uses. Uh, and who it's useful for and who it's not useful for. And I hope anytime I review a product, not not a video game, but a product, that I'm able to do that in that light where I can see where these power banks, like I even talked about in the video, that there are more convenient power banks out there that directly connect to your Switch, but they don't provide as much juice uh, and they make your switch bulkier, which is not something I enjoy. And plus, they're not multi-use generally. So, like these power banks, you can use them for more of your electronics than just the switch. And I like I like having uh, both sides of the coin like that because it, it's something that is honest. I feel like if there's nothing else you can get on my product reviews, it's honesty. Regardless of if I was even paid, say someone paid me money to look at a product, the moment they tell me. Uh, that you know, it, it's fine if they have like a list of features they want me to go through. But if they tell me something like I need to say something positive about this, I will not do that product. Uh, I don't care if they pay me twenty thousand dollars to say something positive. I will not review that product because that's not a review. That's a product advertisement, and I will let them know that I have no problem doing product advertising. It just won't be a review. It would be. Uh, like you see some other YouTube channels when they have sponsored products where they, at the beginning of the thing, that they'll say, hey, you know, do you need <laughs> do you ha- need issue managing your finances as an entrepreneur? Why don't you check out FreshBooks? Uh, do you need help taking apart a computer part? Why don't you uh, check out iFixit or you know the dbrand skins? Hey, would you like a, a light skin that helps grip and make your phone look cool? Well, why don't you check out dbrand? Uh, I'm okay with those kind of sponsorships. I don't think there's anything wrong with those kind of sponsorships. And generally, companies that pay out money for those sponsorships, are, you know, the products are pretty high quality, even if they're not for everyone. And I'm okay if someone wants to pay me for a sponsorship, but if they pay me for a review and they weren't, they're not going to let me be honest, I'm not going to do the review. Uh, because, as I said, I thought the Rav Power power banks were fantastic. Rav Power, the representative that was talking to me, uh, while he was very respectful and very kind, said some things that weren't true and were proven not true in my testing. And I don't know if that's indicative of their customer service, but that obviously gives me a bad impression of their PR department. Uh, That doesn't mean the product is bad, because I actually give the products very positive reviews. But uh, it was very confusing. We even had someone who bought the product who said the the promo code didn't work. And I understand, like, I don't know what's up with the promo code, uh, the email exchange was really weird. They, so some weird things about the promo code. I didn't really understand it. They wanted me to use their Amazon links, which I did not use. I put my own affiliate links in, which they didn't tell me I couldn't do, so I'm not breaking a contract with them. And if they have issues with me doing that, whatever. I'll send my RAV power, power banks back. I said I have a whole bunch of power banks. I don't need them. Um, I would like to keep them. They definitely are the best, but I can just buy my own. Uh, so... It's it, it's just really weird working with them. They were the weirdest product I've done so far where they were sent, sent me a product for review. Um, but yeah, interesting stuff. I'm glad you like it. Uh, when it comes to game reviews, uh, those are a lot harder because there's the bare bones unbiased nature of what's the frame rate, right? What's the resolution like? Uh, do Is there latency in the controls? Uh, and then after that, I feel like everything is just opinion based. Like what makes a good story? It's going to vary person to person. Uh, what's a good visual style? Again, it's going to vary person to person. The only facts you can give are technical performance. Uh, after that, you're no longer looking at uh, at anything else but an opinion. And that's why when people say, I want unbiased reviews of games, uh, that's what Digital Foundry is for. They give you technical analysis of games. That's unbiased. But you're not actually getting an opinion on if the game is good or not. Uh, again, it's an opinion. So uh, those kind of reviews are very different from a product review to me. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, th- there's still opinions involved in product reviews, but it's after a lot of testing. Uh, gameplay stuff is all about personal preference. So if you like my preference in games, you'll probably end up liking my reviews on games, if I ever do game reviews. I, I've done them in the past in written form. I haven't really done a lot of videos of them, so we'll see if I ever do more video reviews in the future. Uh, moving on. One of the, the, the final video I did this week uh, was looking back on Nintendo's history of innovating home consoles. Uh, and this was all based on comments by NVIDIA where they talked about how Nintendo's always been an innovator and a risk taker. 
because uh, they were talking about how uh, their Tegra X1 sales have more than doubled year on year, and that's primarily because of Switch and how they're really happy for Switch and happy for Nintendo. Uh, and they should be happy for themselves because they created the tech for the Switch, you know, the internals, and uh, they're providing all of the, uh, the like all of the customer service to, to third parties for uh, for making games on their architecture because it is NVIDIA's architecture. Anyways, uh, the skinned Mexican F-word head, and I'm sorry, you'll see the name on screen if you really want to read it, uh, had this to say. Nintendo was almost never innovative. They usually copied or took ideas from other companies. Examples. Analog thumbsticks were originally on the Sega Dempo controller rather than the N64 controller. Haptic feedback was made with the Aura Interactor rather than the N64 Rumble Pack. The D-Pads technology was made with the Intellivision rather than the Game & Watch. The shoulder buttons were also made on the Intellivision rather than the SNES. Motion controls were made with the Atari Listic rather than the Wii. Handheld gaming systems were made with the Mattel Auto Racer rather than the Game & Watch. The touchscreen was made on the Tiger GameCom rather than the DS. The trigger button was made on the Bali Arcade rather than the N64 controller. And the wireless controllers uh, were made by the CX42 controllers rather than the GameCube Wavebird. And finally, the hybrid console gaming was made with the NVIDIA Shield rather than the Nintendo Switch. And I chose this comment uh, because... I am cool with people like talking down some of Nintendo's uh, th things that Nintendo gets credit for innovating that they did not create and did not uh, originate and did not do anything original with. Uh, because innovation is essentially about having an original idea. Uh, the, like the straight up definition is, is something new or original. Uh, and I always feel like something new or original can also be a new or original take on a technology that already exists and doing something with it that hasn't been done before. And that's important to remember because I, I went I went through and did, did some research for this one. I mean, I've got like two pages worth of research here, a page and a half. And because I wanted to make sure that I addressed each of these points because this is a really interesting conversation to me. So uh, I note here that you're correct about the DEMPA controller and the thumbstick. Uh, but I did note that I never in my video credited Nintendo with creating... The, the joystick. Uh, I know other people have, but that's not something I said. It, that's not, that never even came up in my video uh, when I talked about innovation over Nintendo over the years and went console, home console, the home console. That's not something I credited them with. Um, the thing I credited them with was uh, an attempt at expandable, expandable internal memory, uh, like the RAM stuff with the N64 um, and their funky controller design with the three prongs. Uh, and yeah, the, that's really it. I, I didn't say that they were the first people to do joysticks on the controller. Um, I'm well aware of the Sega Dempa, uh, even though it only released in Japan. Uh, beyond that, uh, the Aura Interactor was actually a wearable body suit that used haptic feedback to simulate the feeling of a punch or kick. There was actually some cool partnership deals with this with Street Fighter back in the day. Um, the Rumble Pack was actually a non-wearable wearable, uh, haptic feedback device uh, that connected to a controller. So while they both are using haptic feedback and the wearable bodysuit came first, this was a non-wearable controller device, which is, yes, the first time that's ever happened. So uh, I, I don't know. They, they didn't invent the technology, but they invented the method of delivery in a non-wearable fashion. So, I mean... Apples to oranges here with with with, uh, with innovation. Um, you don't have to develop the exact technology behind something to be innovative with a product. Uh, most technology, um, uh, most innovative things have happened before, uh, or most most technology for new ideas you see out there has existed in some form before. But someone did something new and unique with it, which is what Nintendo did with the Rumble Pack. So it, that meets the definition of something new and original because they did something original with an existing technology. Um, moving beyond that one, uh, the Intellivision did create the tech for a 16-directional pad. Uh, and the goal behind that was to replace joysticks. Um, basically replace all the exact functionality of joysticks with allowing the 16 directions. And they were indeed the first company to do that. Uh, but they didn't invent the exact D-pad. 
They did invent the technology behind what the D-pad became, but Nintendo originated the cross pattern, which did not exist before the Game & Watch. Um, and that's important to remember that while that directional pad was a replacement for the input of a joystick, it wasn't trying to mimic a joystick. The 16 directional input that was created before the D-pad was literally trying to mimic a joystick, whereas the, the D-pad itself was never trying to mimic it. It was trying to mimic its own thing. It, it was trying to create a simplified version uh, that made more sense for the kind of games they wanted to make and made more sense for consumers. Uh, because replacing a giant joystick with a 16-directional pad uh, is fine, but uh, Nintendo didn't think that was the right way to go about it. And even to this day in a lot of their D-pad stuff, it's still only 8-directional, uh, which, again, that's half the directions of the original uh, design, because, again, Nintendo's not trying to replace a joystick with a D-pad. Um, so, again, they did something original with it, uh, even if they didn't develop the technology that allowed that originality to exist. Uh, let's see. Uh, you are correct on the shoulder buttons within television, but I note that I never gave them credit for the shoulder buttons. I know other people have, but I never did that. Uh, in fact, I was using shoulder buttons, believe it or not, on PC before ever on SNES, so I was never giving them credit for that. Uh, in fact, I said that the SNES was their least innovative console. It's iterative on purpose. And yeah, uh, I don't think the SNES was innovative at all. I think the SNES was what it was, a super NES. Uh, it was a souped-up NES with twice the power. It's what consoles do today. It was the PlayStation 3 to PlayStation 4, the Xbox 360 to the Xbox One. That's what it was. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, I feel like generations like that, even with Nintendo, should happen. Like I think there should be a Switch 2 that is an iterative console that's more powerful and perfects on the design of the Joy-Cons. I absolutely think that should happen. Um, that It might not be original, but not all generations have to be. And this was a case where Nintendo wasn't innovative. So, yeah, I don't think the SNES was innovative at all. But there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, and it said, yes, the Atari List Stick was the first motion control joystick. And if you look at it, I'll see if I can find an image to throw up here. Uh, it's like this black stick with a button on top. And literally, uh, the one of the few games that works with you that you can maybe find a YouTube video on, uh, it's literally just, it's just a wireless joystick. For I mean, it, it's not... In a traditional pad, it's just a stick, but it's a wireless joystick. That's what it was. Uh, and it used, I, I noted here that it actually used mercury switches to create the motion effect of a wireless joystick. Uh, and this is notable because uh, when you're talking about innovation, sometimes it's about taking an idea to the next level. And Nintendo, what Nintendo did is they introduced motion uh with accelerometers and gyro into a home console platform, uh, which is something that definitely the Atari List Stick was not doing with their Mercury switches. And moreover, it wasn't just a control stick replacement like the original. It had full-on motion controls that, that went way further than just replacing a joystick um, or replacing a button press. So, uh, yeah, the, the Wii was definitely... The, the Wii motion thing, uh, the Wii stuff was definitely... A hell of a lot more advanced and had a lot of original ideas going into it. Now, did they develop accelerometers and gyros? Of course, they didn't invent any of that stuff. And some of that had existed in controllers before, but not to this level of motion capability, uh, at least on a home console front. So that's what Nintendo gets credit for. That's where they innovated and that's what they popularized. Uh, so, yeah, that, that's kind of my take on that. Uh, and then I, I go on to say that I don't recall saying the Game Boy was the first video portable video game machine. Maybe others said that. I don't know. That was never me. Uh, the very first one I played was actually a football game, and that released like in the early 80s. So um, people often just think it was the first one uh, to have interchangeable game cartridges, which isn't true either, and I knew that wasn't true. Uh, the Microvision actually holds that crown in 1979. Uh, what it was the first at doing was having a cartridge-based system with a D-pad and four face buttons. Uh, successfully melding their Game & Watch brand with the NES. That's what it was the first thing to do. Uh, and you, you might not call that innovative, but it sure as heck felt original and innovative at the time because there was nothing like this before that. Um, and while I didn't talk about Nintendo's handhelds in this video, there was a huge five-minute portion I had recorded that did, and, it never, and in that thing, I never once stated the Game Boy was the first at doing anything. Um, again... Its original concept was just the idea of combining the Game & Watch and the NES together in portable form, which it was a brilliant move. 
No one had done that before. Uh, moving on. Uh, yes, the Tiger GameCom had a portable gaming touchscreen before DS. Just like Nintendo had dual screen gaming before the DS back during the Game & Watch days. But it was the first device to have dual screen gaming where one of them was a touchscreen for gaming purposes. So, no, they weren't the first. Like I don't know. I don't remember anyone ever saying Nintendo was the first one to have a touchscreen, even in gaming. Uh, Nintendo was just the first one to have the dual screen capabilities with a touchscreen as one of them. Uh, again, that's an original idea and a new concept using existing technology. Uh, it's important to remember with innovation, it doesn't just mean coming up with the technology. It's how you use the technology. And I feel like that's something a lot of people miss when they're trying to argue that Nintendo isn't innovative. It's not just about inventing new technologies. It's inventing new ways of using that technology. Uh, now, I never claimed, uh, I'm going to say that I never claimed the N64 was the first with the trigger button. I said its placement conveniently under the thumbstick was new. Also, from what I can look up about the Bali Arcade, it was not a controller for a home console system, but rather an arcade unit controller, which is a different field of gaming compared to gaming at home. And again, I could be wrong on this front. This is the one that I'm not sure about because I, I could not find a lot of information about the Bali Arcade controller. So uh, if you can provide, if someone out there knows about this and can provide more information, I'd love to know. Uh, but again, I was talking specifically about trigger placement underneath the thumbstick. And if that's not uh, to Nintendo, I don't remember even saying that that was innovative. I just said that was really cool. Um, it made me like games like GoldenEye better. And I'm kind of sad now that it's on the, that now trigger buttons are uh, on shoulder buttons now. But uh, anyways. Um, I also never said that they were the first with wireless controllers. And I saw, I'd said this earlier in, in Prime Comments here is that Nintendo actually lost a patent suit on the WaveBird and had to stop making them. Uh, it's a fantastic controller, but it apparently used stolen tech. So, yeah, uh, that Nintendo definitely was not the first with a wireless controller. Uh, I knew that. One existed, I think, for Atari. So, I, yeah, I don't... You're putting words in my mouth, man? Um, and then uh, I go on to say that no one actually ever said that Nintendo was the first with a hybrid system. And you're actually wrong. NVIDIA isn't either. The, uh, that honor belongs to the Turbo Express. Bet you didn't know that one. Uh, which was a portable Turbo Graphics 16 console that could connect to a TV with a Turbo Vision TV tuner. Beyond that, the original portable NVIDIA Shield in 2013 was only able to play console quality games, in this case PC games, through streaming. It did not play AAA quality console games locally only Android apps. So it was basically a tablet. Uh, even though it really wasn't a tablet, it was weird. It was connected to a game controller. It was a really weird concept. Uh, but I do note that uh, in the years that follow, they released the Shield tablet, which eventually contained an X1 and allowed for console games to run locally while using a controller, while having a cable connected to the TV. Again, the hybrid concept. Despite all of this, the Switch in portal mode that provides a traditional controller capabilities and motion and NFC and IR will also be detachable for additional functionality while being the first set of controllers to ever have HD rumble technology. That's right. Nintendo invented a new rumble technology. Uh, as well as a true next generation of haptic feedback uh, it's also not the first portal device to have a proper docking solution rather than a cable, but it's the first gaming-specific console to do it in this way. So, no, Switch is not the first hybrid, but it's the first at doing a lot of things that ended up making it successful. So, again, it's not just about being the first at doing something. It's about how you do it. And that and how you do something can be innovative. Touch screens existed <laughs> before the iPhone and before the iPod, but it was how Apple used these screens uh, that ended up innovating the entire mobile phone space. So again, there's just a lot of things to think about when you talk about innovation. Uh, but anyway, this is another long video. You guys have excellent comments out there. Again, I want to thank you for tuning in to Prime Comments Episode 2. Uh, if you would like to hear more of my opinions, you know, I'm here every single day, folks, at Nintendo Prime. As always, I will catch you in the next one.